So um, I'd like to, this is always a little bit obscure, but introduce the introducer. Um, Sylvia uh, Benedito, who is an assistant professor of landscape architecture in the Graduate School of Design. And um, I got in touch with, Sylvia actually got in touch with me. Uh, I teach this course called Primitive Navigation, and one of the units we do is weather forecasting. So the idea is that the students have to learn how to look up at the sky, identify cloud formations and wind directions, and predict whether or not uh, it's going to rain the next day. And um, so they actually have to go out and videotape themselves and stake themselves to a prediction and see how well they do. And they actually tend to do rather well as time goes on. And um, Sylvia was interested in the um, effect of um, weather in designing landscapes, which is rather obvious because trees are subjected to wind and, and growth patterns with the sun. So I gave a couple seminars in her, a um, couple talks in her seminar. Um, but I have a fun story with her permission I'm going to relate. Um, so she knows that I'm into um, this, this outdoorsy natural navigation sort of thing. And uh, there is a, um, uh, I guess, a guest professor lecturer uh, named Chad Oppenheim, who's a designer from Florida, who comes up and periodically has other guest lecturers talk. So Sylvia said, oh, we're going to have this, this Native American storyteller come, and you're just going to love what he has to say. Um, so I had a Friday morning when I had my choice between a video conference with Geneva, Switzerland, or listening to the Indian storyteller. So you can imagine which one I chose. So we went over to the grad school of design, and then we had to walk somewhere where there were woods. So we went to the, the um, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which has this beautiful grounds and, and a building in the center, which is the home of the America, American Academy. And allegedly, the, one of the oldest local stands of trees that have been undisturbed in the area. So it seemed like a fitting place to have an Indian storyteller tell his stories. So one of the things he did, and for those of you who saw my sun compass, you, you get the idea. So he put a stick in the ground. You could see the shadow of the stick and put down a quarter. And then 15 minutes later, put down another quarter. And then the students could figure out which way was east and west and north and south from that. And then he told this, this great uh, story about um, uh, creation mythology in the Wampanoag tribe, and then talked about uh, kind of the general philosophy of paying attention to the sun and the moon. And all these things were great because they resonated with me. And then he said he was going to show a Native American fire building thing. Uh, and so, you know, this is a privately held ground, and he took out a bow. And, uh, and drill and try, and that wouldn't work because it was a little bit too damp. And then he had a flint and a piece of metal that he struck, and he succeeded in getting a little fire going. Uh, okay. Then he said, okay, now you guys try it. So we had like six or seven kits of uh, fire starting flints and metal associated with it, and he started handing it out to all these grad school of design students. And pretty soon, there are seven fire go fires going on the grounds of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and all the smoke billowing up. And, and the, the security guard uh, in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as you might think, was not terribly pleased. And he was going apoplectic and saying, who the hell is the professor of this thing? And Chad was the guest, really. And so the only Harvard professor present was me. And, and pretty soon, the four Harvard police department members show up, at which point we had had the fires extinguished and everything was kind of cool. But you know, there was this, this, this moment where you know, I saw these seven fires going and all these students jumping around in glee. And I'm thinking, mm, I don't know. This doesn't seem so good. Anyway, with that, having said that, <laughs> Here's Sylvia. I want to thank uh, um, Dean Lees and Professor Youth for, for this kind um, invitation and to be part of a cross-disciplinary uh, think tank uh, about the topic, uh, on the topic of navigation. It's really a pleasure for me to be in this symposium for various reasons that I'm going to try to summarize just in three. Uh, one, just to introduce uh, Professor uh, Richard Feinberg. Not only I'm, I'm acquainted of his work, but also um, it was really a pleasure to meet him uh, yesterday uh, in, in our animated dinner um, hosted by Dean Lees and talk about several things. Um, we talked about travel, Anuta, of course, um, family, Portugal, uh, multilingual children, and 
guess what, uh, dug out canoes, and how challenging is that <laughs> to, to paddle and to, and, and to sail on those. Um, the second reason is that, as a fact that I'm an urbanist, I'm a designer among a big panel of scientists, so that's really, really a pleasure. Um, and when we start to talk, uh, when we start to design our cities, our neighborhoods, our civic landscapes, one um, important issue is the issue of, of wayfinding and, and circulating and, and navigating. Um, so to design for a community really implies the staging of a spatial narrative. A spatial narrative with various references, um, with various sensations informed by various cues, cues that are physical, climatically oriented, um, immaterial induced, um, etc. And the third reason, um, on a more uh, personal note, is, is the fact that I was born um, and raised uh, in Portugal, uh, right in front of the sea. Um, and in my history and geography classes, I really understood or learned that the Portuguese were kind of the lighting McQueen of, of the seas uh, in the 16th and 17th, 15th and 16th centuries, um, informed by, by the various fields of knowledge uh, coming from uh, astronomy, um, cartography, atmospheric and oceanographic uh, information, and also they crafted a very special boat very fast, um, uh, the Caravella, very small, with, with these kind of triangular uh, sails. Um, I also learned that they perfected the Arab um, navigation tools, the astrolabe and, and uh, the quadrant for their own navigation. Um, through the experience of being in the sea, um, and they also were able to discern um, the Atlantic gyres that help them uh, to master the sailing techniques called the Volta do Mar. Volta do Mar in Portuguese and in English called Turn. This was really a fundamental discovery because it helped them to navigate in the Atlantic Sea, not only to cross, but importantly, to return back home. Um, so I'm, I'm very, so I grew, with this, I grew up with this history and, and lived in these maritime landscapes and cities at the sea edges, cities that most of you know, uh, whoever visits the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, cities that are very charming, very embedded on their weather, um, exposed to the Atlantic winds, Mediterranean winds, refreshing breezes, uh, smooth weather, etc. And I believe that the landscape in which we grow, uh, it's actually the landscape that defines us. Um, in my case, I really think this is my second nature this nature embedded in weather. Um, and, and that second nature really informs my practice, my teaching, and my research. Uh, these three topics are, are focused on the role of atmosphere um, and weather in the design of cities and urban landscapes, um, while the words of landscape really uh, excludes, uh, excludes air. It is my claim that historically, um, the relation between the design of civic landscapes um, and atmosphere is deeper and with wider consequences towards um, ideas of increased comfort, sensorial engagement, um, and well-being. Navigation, uh, from my understanding, stands for my designing uh, and designer understanding, stands for transversing, moving, and it's always relational, it means uh, it evokes the body, meaning individual or collective body, relative to something that is known or fixed something that is exterior to us, but always in continual dialogue and relationship. We navigate everywhere, on in the ocean, in space, on land, in the air, in our cities, in our landscapes, and now in the internet, a world that hosts many places, but it's not real a place as, as we know. Um, so what does it mean to navigate in this non-physical place in the sea of data um, and information, when navigation in itself implies something and somewhere in dialogue, in deeper contact, contact and understanding uh, with the natural world. Having said that, <laughs> Professor Feinberg, uh, Feinberg's focus has been uh, the Pacific Islands navigation techniques, these not based on data, not based on technology or instruments of measure, but mostly um, based on memory um, and observation on the analog of our bodies and the natural world. Um, he teaches in the Department of Anthropology uh, at the Kent State University since 1974. I was two years old by then. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> He's an anthropologist, um, a scholar, an explorer, an adventurer, a scientist, a field researcher, and also a dugout canoeer. <laughs> His areas of research are multiple, um, cultural and symbolic anthropology, cultural theory and social organization, systems of spatial um, orientation, and indigenous navigation, in particular native North American Pacific Islands, anthropolog anthropological ethics, um, etc. He wrote and published uh, multiple articles, which I, you know, it will take me like two days to to state all of those, <laughs> but just to name a few, a few books, um, Anuta's Social uh, Structure of a, Polynesia, a Polynesian Island, Seafaring in the Contemporary Pacific Islands, Oral Tradition of Anuta, Anuta Polynesian Lifestyles for the 21st Century, and Polynesian Seafaring and Navigation. And now, without any further ado, please welcome Professor Feinberg. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia, for that uh, extraordinarily kind introduction. <laughs> um, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, as Sylvia told you, uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist. And you might possibly be wondering just what cultural anthropology has to offer to the study of navigation. After all, many aspects of the subject can be approached just as well or perhaps better by a number of other disciplines. The movements of celestial bodies by astronomy, the um, questions of wave dynamics and currents by oceanography or physics, wind patterns by meteorology, anatomy and physiology of spatial perception and navigation by neuroscience. So how does anthropology fit in? Well, cultural anthropology is the cross-cultural study of the way that people understand, experience, and make their way through the world. And central to what we do in cultural anthropology is what we call ethnography. That is, the attempt to understand diverse communities in their own terms. And fundamental to doing ethnography, at least since the early part of the 20th century, has been participant observation. That means that we try to gain an empathetic feel for the way that others experience their environments by living with them for extended periods, by living the way they do, by learning their language, talking with them, listening to them, going through their activities with them, learning to do the things that they do, and in the process we try to figure out uh, how people outside of the Western tradition accomplish many of the things that we do, but often without modern Western implements. Most of my own work has been with Polynesians in the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. In 1972, I worked with people on an island called Anuta in the southeastern Solomon Islands. Uh, I've been continuing to collaborate with them since that time. In 1984 and again in 2000, I spent time with people from Nukumanu Atoll in Papua New Guinea. In 2007 and 8, I spent about nine months with people from Taumako, again in the Solomon Islands, uh, not too terribly far from Anuta. I have written about seafaring and non-instrument navigation in all three of those communities. And in the process, I've tried to contribute to a long-standing conversation among anthropologists about conceptions of space, patterns of movement, technology, including boat design and construction, sailing techniques, and navigation especially navigation in the absence of such instruments as the sextant, compass, chronometer, or more recently, GPS. Anthropologists working in the Pacific Islands have for a long time been interested in questions of history, prehistory, exploration, and settlement. This was largely prompted by the observation that at the time of first European contact, Virtually every habitable island in the tropical and subtropical Pacific was, in fact, inhabited, 
And that begged the question of how the people living in those places had originally gotten there. Anthropological thinking about that subject has gone through a number of discrete stages. Through the early and middle 20th century, there was a tendency to take oral traditions very literally. For example, in 1938, Sir Peter Buck, also known by his New Zealand Maori name, Tarangihiroa, uh, published a book called Vikings of the Sunrise in which he tried to trace out the patterns of migration and settlement throughout the Polynesian Triangle on the basis of legends and mythology. Buck's approach was pretty much the order of the day for a couple more decades until 1957 when Andrew Sharp published a book called Ancient Voyagers in the Pacific. Sharp, in his book, argued that without instruments, human beings are intrinsically incapable of navigating accurately for long distances out of sight of land, primarily because it would be impossible to detect the direction and strength of currents. Consequently, he proposed that the islands of the Pacific had been settled as a result of accidental drift voyages. In other words, people would go out on a fishing trip or some other presumably short expedition. They'd run into some bad weather, be blown off course. Undoubtedly, most of them would have perished at sea, but a few of them were fortunate enough to wash up on some previously uninhabited island, make a new life for themselves there, and leave their progeny. Sharp's interpretation pretty much carried the day for about another decade, but during the 1960s and 70s, a number of anthropologists began to challenge Sharp's interpretation on the basis of ethnographic investigations, computer simulations, and experimental voyages. The most important of the um, the um, ethnographic investigations were probably uh, ones conducted by Bill Alkire in the uh, atolls of Woliai and um, Lamatrek in Micronesia, and particularly Tom Gladwin's work on Poloat Atoll in what's now the Federated, Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, published in 1970 in a book called East is a Big Bird. In 1972, David Lewis, who was a um, retired physician, a world sailor, and also an anthropologist, uh, published a book called We the Navigators, which was an authoritative compendium of the non-instrument navigational techniques utilized by sailors and voyagers throughout the Pacific Islands. Among the most important of the experimental voyages, well, actually, experimental voyaging is something that has um, been around at least since the Kantiki expedition um, organized by Thor Heyerdahl in 1947. But since the 1970s, experimental voyages have become uh, much more consistent and systematic, and they have shed a great deal of light on the capabilities of human beings um, at sea under the kinds of conditions that probably affected the early uh, explorers of the Pacific Islands. Um, the process of, um, ex of um, experimental voyaging was probably um, really um, prompted by the formation of the Polynesian Voyaging Society in 1973 something that was um, put together by the Hawaiian artist and historian Herb Kane, a surfer, Tommy Holmes, and anthropologist Ben Finney. 
uh, the Polynesian Voyaging Society is still operating, still doing important work, but um, the um, most notable accomplishment of the organization was probably the voyage of Hokulea in 1976 from Hawaii uh, to Tahiti, a distance of over 2,500 miles without instruments under the direction of a uh, navigator imported from Satwal Island in Micronesia, a man named Mao Pialuk. Mao later on taught native Hawaiian Nainoa Thompson uh, much of what he has learned about the arts of navigation and for a couple of decades, Nainoa was the primary navigator of Hokulea as it sailed throughout the Pacific and is now in fact in the process of a circumnavigation of the globe. Based on these various strands of evidence, it's pretty well established at this point that Pacific Islanders did and to a certain extent today still do make long voyages across the open sea, out of sight of land, without instruments, and with a high degree of accuracy. The main techniques are, are also pretty well understood and what I'd like to do in the time that I have left is summarize for you some of the major techniques that have been used. First of all, in the absence, absence of instruments, one is dependent on what's known as dead reckoning. That basically means that you figure out what your current location is on the basis of knowing where you started, the direction that you've been heading, the average speed you've been making, and the amount of time that you've been out at sea. Uh, dead reckoning can actually be quite accurate, but it does require that there be some natural guidepost or signpost that you can use to judge your direction and your progress. What might that be? Well, very commonly used, and perhaps the most reliable, as long as you can see them, would be the movements of stars. Stars rise in the east and set in the west. If you're anywhere near the equator, they follow along a given line of latitude. And what you want to try to do is find a star that is either rising or setting directly over your target island. You point the bow of your canoe toward that star, you keep going in that direction, and eventually you should hit the island. In principle, it's fairly simple and straightforward. In practice, it's a little more complicated for a whole variety of reasons. One is that there is a very good chance that you won't be able to find a star that rises or sets directly over your target island. So it's going to be off a little to the right, a little to the left, and you have to adjust the heading of your boat in order to compensate for the lack of perfect alignment. In addition, um, if you're sailing from one island to another, there is undoubtedly some wind. Chances are the wind is going to be coming from one side or the other, and it will be pushing your boat in a downwind direction. That is what sailors call leeway, and the navigator has to be able to compensate for leeway, or else the wind will push the boat far enough over that um, the navigator will not hit the desired island. In addition to the wind, the water is also going to be moving, what we call currents. Currents might be slowing you down, they might speed you up, they might increase your leeway or they might counteract leeway, but in any case, the navigator has to be able to figure out how strong the currents are and which way they're pushing the boat and take that into consideration as well. Another complication is the fact that stars don't stay in one place. If you're sighting on a star, let's say you're heading west and there's a star in the west that's setting directly over your target island. You point toward that star, but 
in a few minutes, or maybe if you're lucky, in an hour or two, the star sinks below the horizon, and you're not going to be able to use it anymore. Then what do you do? Well, you try to find another star that's following more or less the same trajectory, and you point toward that star. And when that one sinks below the horizon, you find yet another star, and a sequence of stars of this sort that you can follow throughout the night to try to get you to your target island, we typically call a star path. A star path is a little bit complicated too, though, because not every star is going to be following exactly the same trajectory, so we have to be able to figure out just how far one star is off from the one that preceded it or the one that is coming after. Um, assuming that you can do all of that, you should be in pretty good shape, but there are some other ways in which stars can be useful as well. One is the existence of pole stars. A pole star is one that shows you which direction the north or the south pole is located. In the northern hemisphere, we have a very good pole star that we call Polaris, or the North Star. And as long as you can see Polaris, you should be able to figure out which way is north, and from that you know which way the canoe is heading and which way you need to go to find your target island. In the southern hemisphere, we don't have a pole star that's quite equivalent to Polaris, but we have a constellation that's called Crux, or the Southern Cross. The Southern Cross is a constellation that's more or less diamond-shaped or cross-shaped, and even though it moves around, the long axis always points toward the celestial south. It's not quite as precise as the North Star, but for navigational purposes, it's generally sufficient to give the navigator an idea of which way is south, and again, on that basis, the navigator can figure out which way he should point the canoe. Another way in which stars can be useful is the existence of something known as a zenith star. A zenith star is one that is directly overhead, and because stars anywhere near the equator, follow a given line of latitude. If you can identify a zenith star, you should be able to tell what your current latitude is. This makes possible something called latitude sailing. If you know the latitude of your target island, you can sail up or down to that latitude and then run before a tailwind, and as long as you can stay on that latitude, eventually you should hit the desired island. Well, so far so good, but stars are only useful when you can see them, which means that they're not useful during about 12 hours out of a 24-hour day. What do you do when you can't see the stars? Well, fortunately, there's one star that we can see during the day. We call it the sun, and like the stars at night, it rises in the east and it sets in the west, and as long as it's fairly early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you can tell which way is east and which way is west, which way you are heading, which way you should be heading by sighting on the sun. The problem there is that during the middle of the day when the sun is high in the sky, it's not very useful for navigational purposes. Also, when the sky is overcast and you can't see the sun, or at night you can't see the stars, you need something else to guide you. And what might that something else be? Well, one good possibility is wind patterns. In many places, the winds are pretty constant. In much of the tropical Pacific, we have what are known as the trade winds, which blow fairly constantly from the same position um, at more or less the same velocity uh, for months at a time. Uh, oh, before we get into that, let me just mention star compasses. Um, a number of communities that have developed uh, or that depend on stars for navigation have developed star compasses. A star compass is an abstract representation of the rising and setting points of major navigational stars um, in relation to the potential destinations. This slide shows you the Carolinian star compass as it was presented by Ward Goodenough 
in a now classic piece that he wrote in 1953. Here we have a more recent rendition of the uh, New Zealand Maori star compass. The star compass that was developed by Nainoa Thompson, uh, the longtime native Hawaiian navigator of Hokulea, and finally a uh, sample of a contemporary Western star compass that was uh, provided compliments of John Hugh. Um, in places where the wind is fairly constant and reliable during certain times of year, uh, a number of communities have developed wind compasses. Here's a representation of the wind compass from Anuta that I put together in collaboration with um, the premier navigator of that place and time, a man named Punuko Manaya, in 1983. And here is a representation of the Vayakau Taumako wind compass that I put together with the aid of master navigator Clement Teniau in 2007. Um, the wind can be very useful, but within certain limits. Winds can change. They shift, they veer, and even during the trade wind season, there are times when the wind may be, may be coming from a position that's as much as diametrically opposite to what you normally expect. So you'd like at least one other mechanism that you can call upon and most commonly, Pacific navigators look at wave patterns. The kind of wave that is most commonly used on the open sea that's most helpful and most critical is something called a swell. Swells are regular, constant waves that are caused by winds that blow over thousands of miles of open sea and um, the swell continues to go in the same direction in spite of the fact that local winds may shift. Local winds may cause some local chop or what are called seas and they may not correspond with the dominant swell but a capable navigator is able to tell which way the swell is going and differentiate the swell from local seas and on that basis point the canoe in the correct direction. So you're going along toward your target island, you get fairly close, say you're 15, 20, 25 miles away, you still can't quite see the island unless it's very high and you wanna make sure that you're homing in on the island. You don't wanna sail past it because if you do, it may be hundreds or even thousands of miles to the next island. What do you do there? Well, you look for some other natural phenomenon and most frequently, uh, well, one of the frequent um, uh, signposts that navigators will look for would be certain kinds of birds. Birds that nest on shore at night and fly out to sea to fish during the day. If you're traveling early in the morning, just after sunrise, or late afternoon, just before sunset, and you see a flock of birds of the correct type flying in a straight line, you can infer that those birds are either coming from their nesting place or returning to their nesting place, and you can follow that flight pattern to get back to your island. Um, the trick there is that you have to be able to differentiate birds that are flying from home or back to home from birds that have already reached their fishing grounds and are just flying around hither and yon looking for fish, in which case they can lead you in a radically incorrect direction. The other major natural phenomenon that Pacific navigators look at is something called reflected waves. When a swell hits an island, it bounces back out towards sea. And when it does that, the contours of the wave and the intensity of the wave change. The navigator is able to tell the difference both by looking and by feeling the way the boat is moving between swells, seas that are caused by the wind, and reflected waves 
and you can follow the reflected waves back to the island of your choice. Um, in a few places, most notably the Marshall Islands of Micronesia, navigators also use something called refracted waves. When a wave hits an island, it will separate, bend around the island, and on the lee side, the waves may cross, they establish interference patterns, and the Marshallese navigator is able to tell from the contours of movement on the surface of the ocean which way the islands that may be of relevance to him are located. Uh, this photograph is one of a so-called so Marshall Islands stick chart. Um, and I'll just say here that uh, the term stick chart is a little bit misleading because these are not maps or nautical charts in the way that we normally think of them, but rather uh, are abstract representations of various wave patterns in relation to islands, in relationship to the position of a canoe at any given point. They're not something that a uh, navigator takes to sea to help him get from one place to another, but rather they're teaching tools that are used uh, by a novice navigator trying to learn the trade. Uh, let me just pass over this last slide and say that it's a uh, representation that was put together by one of my students, Kathy Pyrick, of what she called the Viacau Taumako Navigational Toolkit. She makes the point that navigators put out to sea with a variety of tools in their bag, so to speak, and if one is not applicable, they will pick another one out of that bag and use it. And I can come back and talk more about this during the question period if anyone is interested. Um, I have uh, maybe, well, I'm really out of time, but I'm gonna beg uh, John's and uh, Sylvia's indulgence because John did ask me to say a little bit about what I imagine will be some of the future directions for uh, anthropological studies of navigation. So let me just mention a couple of those. One is the expansion of experiment, experimental voyaging. Uh, I expect that this is going to be something that will continue and will expand in the years to come, at least in part because this is something that is, is of interest not just to scholars, including anthropologists, but it's also of a great deal of interest to indigenous islanders who are trying to reclaim their traditional identity. They've been rebuilding uh, what they consider to be replicas of old voyaging canoes and trying to retrace some of their old voyaging routes. Um, I expect that anthropologists, probably in collaboration with colleagues from other disciplines, will continue to collect ethnographic data uh, relating to voyaging techniques and spatial orientation. Um, I expect that we will continue to explore what um, we can regard as the relationship between spatial cognition and navigation. Part of that, well, let me just call your attention to a recent issue of the journal Ethos, which I'll keep up here, uh, put out by the Society for Psychological Anthropology. This was a special issue that was uh, devoted to spatial cognition and navigation in the Pacific Islands and Indonesia that I co-edited with a colleague, uh, Alex Moyer, from the University of Hawaii. Uh, I expect that there will be continued um, investigation into the relationship between what have been called cognitive maps and the, um, uh, what, what uh, the anthropologist Tim Ingold has referred to as feeling one's way from one place to another uh, on the basis of continued sensory information that uh, continues to get processed as one moves through the environment. Uh, I expect that there will be more studies of certain natural phenomena that have been 
identified by indigenous navigators as critical to their navigational skills, but which have not been verified scientifically. And that begs the question of whether those phenomena are figments of the local imagination or if we just don't have the appropriate instruments to detect those phenomena. And lastly, I expect that there will be continuing studies of the hydro and aerodynamics of the variety of hull and sail designs that one finds in voyaging communities around the world. And here I'd call your attention to a very recent issue of the Journal of the Polynesian Society, which um, has a lead article dealing with varied uh, sail shapes and designs around the Pacific uh, and tests of those sail designs in wind tunnels to assess their efficiency under varying wind conditions. Uh, I think that I've probably exceeded my time, so I'm going to stop there, and uh, I'll be happy to take whatever questions you may have. Before, well, we're going to have approximately 10 minutes uh, for Q&A, uh, but before I open to the audience, I would like to indulge my, myself on questions. And one is actually I would like to, to, to uh, elaborate on this idea of future, uh, the future of the discipline, future direction of research, because I'm very interested in this kind of parent uh, contradiction between field work, which is very kind of, it, it bases very much uh, your, your research, contradiction between field work and um, and the new technologies, particularly the, the remote sensing. So I think my question goes very much on how is your process has been done, how your process has been kind of, of evolving relative to uh -huh. the new technologies, and how those, how those new technologies are going to start to inform new realities within your own uh, discipline. OK, yeah, my, my own um, work has been um, ethnographic field work. And um, primarily what I do in my ethnographic field work is talk to people, talk to navigators. Uh, I try to go out with them on the sea when I can. I ask them what they look for to try to find the um, destinations that they might be heading toward. Um, I try to get information about their understanding of uh, stars, constellations, their movements in relation to various islands, their mental maps of their navigational universes. Um, now, one of the ways in which technology is likely to affect the kind of research that I do is to test the accuracy let's say, of uh, indigenous navigators in terms of um, data that can be verified scientifically. And uh, I was trying to suggest at the end that there are some phenomena that uh, indigenous navigators point to that we haven't been able to verify. Um, my colleague at uh, the University of Hawaii in Hilo, Joe Gens, worked in the Marshall Islands on wave refraction patterns and what he called wave piloting. He also worked with um, um, oceanographers from the University of Hawaii. They put out instruments like uh, sensing buoys and uh, the oceanographers with their equipment were not able to detect the reflection and refraction patterns that the, um, the navigators said they were depending on. Um, so what does this mean? Um, I'm guessing that we'll continue to work on the technology to improve the, um, um, sense, the, the sensing ability of that technology. And um, my guess is that at some point we will be able to confirm that, but maybe not. We'll, we'll find out. I think that leads me to the next question, maybe contradicting the first one, <laughs> which is how do you quantify imagination and, and speculation that probably you also deal with? Uh-huh. <laughs> how do I? Are, are you talking about my imagination or my informant's imagination? Informant's imagination. Ah. <laughs> That is a wonderful question, and 
it can also be a really sensitive question because uh, if people take something really seriously, they don't like someone else coming along and telling them it's just a figment of your imagination. Um, Actually, um, I had a uh, rather uh, dramatic uh, experience of this sort in my last visit to Taumako. Uh, I went out with a uh, navigator whom I mentioned, Clement Teniao, who took me in his motor canoe uh, to all of the islands around the Santa Cruz group. And as we were going along, he was asking, or I, I was asking him, uh, how do you know what direction to go? What are you looking at? What are you feeling? And he would point to some stars. He would point to certain wave patterns. And I would look at my compass and say, that's not where the wave is coming from. Yeah. Um, he would show me his wind compass. And at one point, he would show me the wind compass. He would say that the Tokelau, which is sort of northish, is over there. I'd be in a different place, and he'd say, the Tokelau is over there. And at one point, I started thinking to myself, this guy is just uh, a charlatan. Uh, But he always managed to get us exactly where he said he was going to get us. So clearly, he was working on the basis of some real data. Uh, It was just data that he was somehow not able to articulate in a way that I could make sense of what he was saying. Um, And if anyone is interested in this case study, um, I have an article in the American Anthropologist from 2012, I think, that uh, describes this this experience. (laughs) Thank you so much. So I would like to open to the audience. Do you Uh, mind to state your name, please? Yeah, my name is Harriet Todd, and uh, you talked about various techniques for navigating towards a target. But uh, what if there isn't a target? How, what is the current theory about how the Polynesian islands were settled? Did the people set out purposely, knowing there must have been something there, and, and randomly landed? Or, or how was that? Uh, what's, what's the current theory on that? Yeah, we don't really know for sure how the Polynesian islands were originally populated, but the bulk of opinion seems to be that people would set out on purposeful purposeful voyages of exploration. Um, They would have a pretty good idea of how to get back home if they didn't find anything, and they would follow some lines that were suggested in uh, oral traditions, perhaps, or perhaps intuition, or perhaps they would follow uh, the flight patterns of birds or other wildlife and hope that they would find something. But if they didn't, they would then be able to get back home. There has been um, a, a good deal of discussion now for several decades of the question of whether the islands were populated as a result of accidental drift voyages or intentional voyages of uh, discovery and settlement and perhaps two-way voyages. Um, An island would be settled, then there would be voyages back and forth between the new settlement and the, the old place. And most Polynesian scholars at this point uh, seem to be pretty well convinced that, at least in many cases, uh, purposeful exploration and two-way voyaging uh, did uh, did take place. Maybe the, the next question. Hi, uh, Jeff Howery of Semitic Museum. Thank you. The various references to star charts for the Polynesian and beyond and, and woven constructions, could you speak to those? Um, I'm not sure that I follow the question. What, what do you want to know about star charts? Are, are, they, are they available in museums? Or? Oh, oh. Um, now you're talking about star, uh, star compasses. You're not talking about yeah, yeah. Um, the Micronesian uh, stick charts. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, there are representations of star compasses, um, not so much for Polynesia, actually. Uh, And one of the reasons that perhaps Polynesians were not so um, much into star compasses was that um, 
the Polynesian archipelagos go a long way north and south, and the further you get from the equator, the trickier it is to sail um, by the movements of, of stars. Um, for Micronesia, there are um, some very good illustrations of star compasses. Uh, again, the classic is probably the one that uh, Ward Goodenough from the University of Pennsylvania um, offered in 1953. Um, and there are um, at least some more recent renditions of star compasses from Polynesia. Um, I showed a slide of the uh, Maori New Zealand star compass, at least one version of it, and Nainoa Thompson, um, who was the native Hawaiian um, who learned largely from Mau Pialag of Micronesia, but also uh, learned much of his skill by studying the movements of stars in the Bishop Museum Planetarium in Honolulu with um, the, um, the planetarium astronomer, Will Kaselka. Um, and he has now, um, on the basis of his knowledge of stars and wave movements, um, guided Hokulea through all of the major Polynesian archipelagos and many other parts of the Pacific as well, um, he developed his own star compass, which is not quite the same as the Micronesian star compass, but it um, is um, uh, one that um, is quite detailed, and um, he's, um, he's found it uh, highly effective. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So we just should accept one more question because we just ran out of time. Okay, my name is Jeremy Poole. Um, a long time ago, about 45 years ago, I was doing field work in New Britain, in Papua New Guinea. And sometimes I would accompany a villager off on like a hunting trip through the bush. Mm -hmm. And we'd go for an hour, and I would be just totally lost. If I were told, find your way back to the village, there's no way I could do it. Uh -huh. But we always immediately got back there. And I was wondering, have anthropologists studied sort of this land-based wayfinding, which seems like it must be quite different from what you described at sea, but you're still you're in this visually compromised, totally enclosed bush setting, and what cues yeah. people are using, I have no idea. Yeah, um, I don't know offhand of anything that is quite in that setting. There has been a, a good deal of work on land-based navigation in deserts and in the Arctic, which are sort of like being at sea because you're dealing with wide open spaces and relatively little in the way of uh, landmarks that distinguish one route from another. Um, I suspect that in a uh, rainforest setting, you're dealing as much as anything with um, knowing landmarks, being able to find paths that are just uh, so subtly marked that an outsider has a lot of trouble uh, identifying them, but uh, I really don't know, and um, I don't know of anyone offhand who has worked on that. All right, thank you so much again. <laughs>